Well, let's get Graham Rand started. Uh, we have a guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Harley Ginsburg. Dr. Ginsburg is the um, neonatal medicine section head at Ochsner um, okay. and the medical director of the NICU um, at Baptist Hospital. And um, we're really happy to have him up here today um, as, a, as a guest speaker. Um, Dr. Ginsburg um, is a graduate of Tulane University School of Medicine. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> we'll be okay. Don't worry. We've had, we've had interlopers here before, though. We've been pretty popular with uh, He did his pediatric internship and uh, residency at Tulane and then remained there for a, a neonatal fellowship. And after completing his fellowship uh, is when he took the position um, at Ochsner. Um, he also remains as a clinical associate professor of pediatrics at Tulane. So uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ginsburg um, has uh, successfully led the development of the Ochsner Baptist uh, neonatal program. He's a recognized clinician scholar. He has a number of publications and presentations at local, regional, and national meetings all on issues related to neonatology and the advancements that have occurred in the last 20, 25 years in neonatology. So we're really happy to have him up here. Mm -hmm. One particular interest that he's had recently is the development of a milk bank. And so the primary presentation today is going to be on um, the development of a milk bank in Louisiana and his title is very appropriate. Evolution of Mother's Milk Bank, Louisiana and Ochsner Baptist, eclipsing the odds. And I'll let him explain that. Obviously, good to have you here. Thank, thank you, and good morning. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Any amateur photographers out there? Nobody? Everybody just kind of lives with their cell phone now? <laughs> um, the, the idea behind the eclipsing was a couple of years ago. We had one of the rare solar eclipses that started on the west coast and came all the way across the east. So what we're going to do today as we go through this is you're going to get a chance not only just to learn about how the milk bank evolved, but also take you through what this amateur photographer did and you're going to see um, why at the end. Um, and as a founder and medical director, I'm forced to put this up here that I have no financial, um, well, it, sort of, I really don't have a financial interest. I do in the milk bank working, but I'm not compensated for any of the work that I, I do in the milk bank. And the objectives for this, and I believe they're either on the website or handed to you, is we're going to, de to decrease the feeding intolerance and necrotizing enterocolitis in the NICU, learn how to obtain informed consent because we still have to do that in Louisiana for hum the use of human milk. Learn how we order it through Epic uh, in New Orleans, and then get you all prepared for 2014 where you're going to be sitting in one of the best spots for the next total solar eclipse. This is what we saw in 2017. Um, my wife, Susan, is here. She's an ex-pediatric ICU nurse, and we have a son that I just got back from Afghanistan. He's been in the Army for six years, works on Black Hawk helicopters. The reason I bring that up is because the path of the total eclipse went right through where he was when he got back. So we got a chance to not only visit with him, but see something that, again, put this on your calendar. It really is a life-changing event when you see it in 2024. Um, so when we started out, uh, the the guts of this inside Baptist, Baptist had been hit by uh, Katrina, not so much with the hurricane, but by the fact that the electricity went off and the place ended up being just pretty much totally decimated in terms of mold, in terms of mildew, in terms of once everything got taken out. So we had a piece of this promised to us eventually and it had to be completely gutted and built out in the pretty much about all but 20% of what you're going to see has all been raised philanthropically. So there was not a lot, that while there was some auction or money in it, people have really stepped up with this. People really do get the feel for what donor human milk can do for a baby. And as far as preparation goes, yeah, that's me two and a half years ago. And you notice at the very, very end of that long lens is a filter. And the reason I tell you that is because when you do look at an eclipse and they talk to you about putting on those goofy, funny-looking little glasses, 
Cameras are exactly the same way. If you don't put something on them, you will literally cook the inside of a camera. Um, the milk bank itself really arose from a milk depot, and which came from nothing. Uh, Louisiana did not have anything as far as a milk bank went, a milk depot. Uh, if you talk to a few of the NICUs and their directors and nurses, they were purchasing milk from Denver, they were purchasing it from Austin. There were about two dozen milk banks. And just quite frankly, I got tired of it. Uh, and, the more, and I was probably the biggest skeptic when this all started out that had no real belief that donor milk would make any sort of difference in the necrotizing enterocolitis rate, that it was just an expensive hobby from some people, and that this really didn't have any grounds. And then over the last 10 years, boy, have I been shown to be wrong. And so finally, literally, pardon the pun, I drank the Kool-Aid and started looking at what this really meant to babies. Uh, you, we've always heard about the breastfeeding being the best for a baby, but more and more the data is just so clear that donor milk, when you don't have a mom, a mom that can provide, is life-saving. And the American Academy of Pediatrics now has a, a position statement on this that was put out in 2017, pretty much referring to the fact that if you do not have mom's milk, donor human milk is your next choice. Um, you know, why a milk bank? Well, you know, and this, you know, this could be two or three days worth of information, but we know the benefits to, to babies. We know that there are conditions from which moms have that will preclude her from being able to provide milk. Um, and as I said, the past pasteurized donor human milk, position statement from the academy. And when we started all this, Louisiana had no human milk bank. Um, so first step is from moms to the bank. How do we end up even procuring milk from a mom? And what we do is we have lactating moms. Some will have excess uh, that wish to donate. They're screened. And this involves a, a questionnaire that is similar but not identical to if there are any blood donors here. You know that if you started donating 10 or 20 years ago, it was one page. And now it's two or three pages. So it's a pretty extensive questionnaire. If they're approved, they'll pump, label, freeze, and then either bring their milk to an authorized depot, or personally, we've got some moms that will ship directly. And this, the cost of this is all borne by the bank. So when we, we're hoping to actually, with LSU and Auctioner and Shreveport, we're hoping you will be one of the depots, hopefully the first depot in, in Shreveport to be um, connected with us. Um, the bank accepts the frozen milk, and then the processing begins. So this is about five minutes in. Okay, so if you look at about one o'clock, you see a little bitty part of the sun that's had a bite taken out of it by, by the moon. And when you set up for this and you learn how to do this, and it takes a fair amount of time, you're sitting there and waiting and waiting, and finally when that first little bite comes out, you realize you're not a lemming. You haven't just been brought to this one place with millions of other people for some <laughs> celestial reason, you know. Um, but it's, the sunspots even surprised me. And this is with nothing more than a 35 millimeter camera and a, and a 500 millimeter lens. Um, this is in March of last year. We received certification from the Human Milk Banking Association in North America. This is a strictly volunteer donating group. So there's no mother that's paid for any milk donation here. And as of yesterday, we actually got recertified. So we finished our first year and passed an uh, inspection. Um, the mission statement for the Human Milk Bank Association North America advances the, the field of nonprofit milk banking through member accreditation, development, and evidence-based best practices advocating breastfeeding, lactation, and ethically sourced and equitably distributed meaning that it's got nothing to do whether or not you're insured, Medicaid, um, you know, uh, and that was something that one of their mantras and we pretty much live by in the NI. Um, a bank is a facility where the milk is cultured, homogenized, pasteurized, and we'll go over that in a little bit, rebottled, recultured a second time, and then frozen. If the milk is acceptable, it's made available for distribution. Uh, with the request from a physician, in some cases a nurse midwife, but most of the time it ends up being physicians or sometimes physician assistants, 
Um, the milk can be purchased either by a hospital or a family and shipped to those in need. The cost is never for the milk. It's only to pro all the processing that, it, that takes place. And again, that's similar to blood. Most places do not sell blood, but all the testing that has to go on before that can be infused into a patient, that, that's where the expense really is born. Uh, when milk gets shipped to us, uh, boxes are usually, again, sent to, whether it's a, if you have a depot, then all the boxes would be here. We'll get the milk. It'll, get, it'll be frozen beforehand, and we, would, and we teach the folks um, that set up depots because we will want for three years in the process of just trying to learn how this all worked. Um, the folks in Austin were our mentor bank, and so we visited them. They came to us, and it, was, it became a lot more than I had ever really envisioned, and it hasn't changed. Uh, we're now doing outpatient. We're even, I think I touch on this later on, for those that have taken care of children, babies that have had chylothoraces, you know that you're feeding them when you get the chance to feed them a specialized, as they say, formula. Uh, not in our PICU anymore. Now what we do is we actually take donor milk, we centrifuge it, pull off the fat, and these babies get to get donor human milk until a time when the chylothorax seals and they can then be fed regular milk. So things that I had never envisioned and I'm just starting to learn more and more about the outpatient aspects of this uh, have been very enlightening. This is a picture of where the milk banks in the United States are. Um, I, there's one, the one for us in Louisiana was actually put up there while we were sort of a depot in a developing bank. But there were some states that kind of surprised me, mainly Arkansas, Tennessee, and Georgia. Especially Georgia, you would think with Atlanta and being a really big city and some big medical institutions. But it's not as it, if, after having done this, I kind of understand if you don't have a group that gets behind you to do this, it really is, it's more than a labor of love. It really does take an awful lot of work and some very devoted people to get this thing up and running. Um, Mississippi's got one in Jackson, Alabama and Birmingham, Florida and Orlando. Texas is one of the only two states that has two of them just because of the pure size and the demand. And the demand is constantly rising. Now we're about 25% in. Hasn't started changing outside, but eventually things start getting gray and colors start changing, and it's really fun. Um, in one year, from January 17, we were nothing more at that time to us than Louisiana had one milk bank, one milk um, depot, and that was us partnering with the folks in Austin. We had raised about a half a million dollars. This is, as I said, some of the organizations, Baptist Community Ministries, Methodist Health System, Auctioner had put in um, a significant amount of capital, uh, the Golden Ring Foundation, the Jewish Foundation that came up, the Junior League of New Orleans, it just kept, you know, I, I think once the idea got out there, I mean, if you walk out to anybody on the street and just say something about a human milk bank or even just a human milk donation, you get the same face. You get the look of disbelief, the head gets cocked to about 20 to 25 degrees, and then the phrase is almost identically, they don't really do that, do they? And you start realizing that the educational aspects here are huge, and then you start learning more about milk sharing, which goes on all the time, and anybody want to go home and take a look at eBay, you can buy milk that you have not a clue what you are purchasing. You don't know if it's CMV positive, HIV positive, you don't know if it's been cut with water, cut with cow's milk, you don't have any idea. So this is why the Academy came out, and it's a pretty strong statement if you, if you pull it out to see what they say about uh, pasteurized donor milk. Uh, we came up with the architectural drawing, started ordering equipment when we realized the project really had legs, um, and then started getting the inspections lined up, and as you might imagine, it's kind of interesting to see people that have no earthly idea how to inspect a milk bank come and do a milk bank inspection. Because it really, when you get down to it, had to be treated as a food. And so they know how to inspect cafeterias and from the state and the city. And so we just kind of, they humored us and we humored them and we all got through it. A year later, in March of last year, there were now two non-auctioner milk depots open with 
various uh, states of development for others. The philanthropic donations had really gotten to the point we knew the project was going to take somewhere between three quarters and a million dollars, and we had exceeded that. And we've kept this up. And the reason we have is because donor milk is not cheap. It's about $4.50 to $5 an ounce. If you're ordering it in the NICU, you're probably ordering it to start off with with a couple ml. So the trick is to be very frugal with it. We bottle it in three, bo three ounce and one and a half ounce bottles. But the more money that we have that comes in through donations, the more this actually will mean that we hopefully never, but reality may be different, have to increase the price and keep the number of paid staff to a bare minimum as well. So there's an awful lot of volunteerism that takes place with this too. So the building got completed, the equipment arrived, and we got approved by the state. Fast forward another year, we moved from all the things we had done in March of last year. The state now has four depots. Mothers that we've screened as of about a week ago was 403. 139 of them have been approved. We've received 690 gallons of human milk. We keep an inventory of between 150 and 200. There's a contamination rate of 3% because there's one or two bacteria that even with pasteurization, you really can't use for, for um, distribution. And at present, we've dispensed 167 gallons. And you can take that, multiply it times 128 to figure out how many ounces. And the numbers really start getting pretty impressive for what these moms have done. The depots that we've got active right now are at Baptist, Baton Rouge, Lafayette. Pink and Blue is actually a, like a child sort of, um, where they sell baby clothes and things like that. So other places, you don't have to be a medical facility to be a distribution, uh, to, I'm sorry, to be a, a receptacle for this. St. Tammany Parish Hospital on the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain, ones that are developing are on our West Bank, Oxford St. Anne, in Raceland, Louisiana, three Healthy Start locations in New Orleans, St. Francis in Monroe, St. Francis in Alexandria, and Terrebonne. And we're looking forward to adding your name to the list next. Um, contracted hospitals. Once you've started this and hospitals want to start purchasing, it's still a business transaction. And so you have to have contracts set up. So the ones on the left all have contracts right now, and the ones on the right um, have contracts that are pending. You'll see at the bottom, University of Mississippi and Jackson. And that's just because, again, you want to have a backup. We, at Baptist, we have a backup. It's Austin. Because we never know when something's going to spin up in the Gulf. We never know when something may take the bank down for a while. And so Jackson, University of um, Mississippi, they wanted a backup to their milk bank in Jackson. We've even had calls from Orlando. So it's, it's one of those things where you want to be able to really network and be able to have this available. Up at about a third at this point. As I joke with people, I say, you really haven't made it anywhere until you hit the signage board somewhere. <laughs> and so finally, we got on the marquee. It's at the bottom, but we're, we're, we're on there. So people were able to find the milk bank when they come in to us. We've even got, a, and I didn't take pictures of this, but uh, at Baptist, when we moved in, the, the, the parking garage has a, um, a valet service, and we brought, and it's, they're not, they're, it's a private contractor, and we got them on board. We put a freezer in, like, they're practically their little stand, so moms now can come through and literally drive through. If they've been vetted and you've got your little four-month-old in the back and you've pumped it, or you can literally hang it out the window and somebody can pick it up as long as they've got their, their, their uh, card and they know and then we pick it up from them and it's all in the same building. So part of this is really making it as convenient as you possibly can to your donors. Um, this is what one of the freezer rooms looks like. It, these are... Um, this is sort of what it looks like when moms donate, and this is raw milk that's come in. Uh, it's kept inside certain freezers. All the freezers are laid, the shelves are labeled so that we know where. We've got a couple computer programs to say when this milk came in, and just like in a grocery store, you're moving stock. You're moving things through so you're using the freshest milk. 
if you notice, there are, there are names on the freezers. You could have just given them freezer A and freezer B, but in New Orleans, nothing is that simple. And so the folks in the, in that were working with us say, no, we're going to name these after Mardi Gras crews. And so Rex, I guess, got first money, but then it only made sense to use all the female crews. And so there's about three or four of them down there. One of them's Iris, one of them's Muses. Um, and so that's where all the milk comes in, and actually it goes back into after we have finished, but certain spots and certain freezers. When the milk comes in, the, the, this is the, and, and now we've decided we're going to start processing, this is the ante room. So you can see the flasks with the aluminum foil on top, and in the back there is an ice machine. You're going to understand why in a little bit. We've got a dishwasher for everything that has to go through at 180 degrees. 180 degrees two or three times, three times before we can even use it after a usage. So it really, again, is, I mean, I would hope that restaurants that we go to take care of their utensils and glassware to this. I doubt it, but to topic for another talk. Um, this is inside the lab. So you've come through that door. You see there's actually another refrigerator freezer sitting there. Uh, the, the, the tables are... You know, this is all stuff that you can clean readily, uh, and you can see that there's a window here to the left. And when we built it, the architect was really kind of puzzled, said, why do you want a window in here? And we said, because this is going to be such a novelty that people, we figured, might stop by and look. Little did we know the traffic that stops, because we'll process usually on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and it's... I guess, since most people don't really know what goes on in any kind of lab, the ability to, to literally look and watch what takes place is pretty um, unusual. I'll leave it at that. The, let me see, I think there's a laser here. Yeah, these are pasteurizers. And this is what a milk analyzer looks like. We can determine protein, fat, so you get carbohydrates. So we have a pretty good idea. If you want to order 24 calorie milk, we can send you, assuming we've had mothers that, because we're not using Fortifier. As you probably have known, if you've worked in the NICU, if you've even just seen moms right after they pump, sometimes milk looks like half and half, and sometimes milk looks like maybe um, just really, really diluted type of skim milk. And so there's so much variation batch to batch and sometimes pump to pump that if you're feeding a baby in the NICU and having done this for not as long as Dr. Pramanic, but most of you, you know, over 30 years at this point, you realize you don't know what you're giving a baby. When you give it right from mom to the baby, you don't know if you're giving 18, 20, 22. We've got moms that are pumping, and, and when we've analyzed their milk, it's 30 calories per ounce. So when we get that in the lab, we can do a little bit of uh, kitchen chemistry. We can do a little bio and milk engineering, lacto engineering, I think is the term they're using now. And so if we have some 30 calorie milk, and we have some 18 calorie or 20 calorie milk, and somebody orders 24 cal, we can actually do that with no additional fortifier. You may want to go higher based on your patient's needs, but it becomes available. It is at the, we're sort of at the mercy of the milk that does come in, but it's really nice to be able to offer that without having to start adding either cow milk or additional human milk fortifier to bump it up. Um, so if you're going to name your your freezers, after parades, we decided we would name the pasteurizers after Louisiana musicians. So we had Fats Domino, and Fats kind of was a double entendre for those that get into that. Um, Louis, for Louis Armstrong, and they made me pick a musician that was still with us, so Harry Connick Jr. got, got, they got named. So those are the three. These are different types. This is one that, this is more a manual one, and this is more automatic. And so we've got three of them just because you know that something's going to go down and something's not going to work. And so three of them is at least something where if we had to do two runs or even do them on weekends, we could keep things going. And we fully expect the demand has done nothing but go up. There are 25 level three or above NICUs in the state of Louisiana. And you saw the limited number of units that are 
right now that are under contract. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't other hospitals that are using it. They're not under contract yet with us, but it's still one of those things where we know the numbers are going to do nothing but go up, and we've already got space sort of promised to us for expansion. Uh, again, inside the unit, there'll be um, baker's racks for moving milk, about 50% through at this point. Um, what does it take to run a to milk bank? A director, myself, or a medical director, a milk tech, a donor coordinator, and volunteers. So you, again, only three of those um, folks are paid employees because we have the same mission. We're, we're using milk as well. So it serves no purpose. And actually, the whole idea behind this, even though I didn't have a lot of fans originally at Auctioner with this, was to run it about as close to cost neutral as possible. It's not meant to make money. It's really, you know, if you work with children, if you've done this for any part of your life, you, you don't, pediatrics is a calling. Whether you're in the NI, you know, doing general peds. So we, again, trying to sell this originally, we knew it was going to have to be a big philanthropic effort. One thing I was not doing, as some people in the audience have heard me joke, the CEO, Warner Thomas, is a Boston Red Sox fan. And I'm a Yankees fan. I grew up in the Bronx. So we don't always see eye to eye. And I wasn't going into Warner's office to ask for money. I knew we could do this. And I was more than pleasantly surprised when we did. So now we're getting into the real um, nuts and bolts of this. The milk that you saw that's raw will sometimes be brought to us in different, um, sometimes it's literally in baggies, other times it'll be in a um, little bit, things that are a little bit easier to access, but we'll take it out when we can. If we're not processing in the afternoon, if we're gonna process in the morning, the milk gets taken out, put in a refrigerator, and thawed overnight. The next step is filtering, those big triangular things that you're looking at here and here um, are literally just nothing but big filters, which will catch everything from, and this sounds a little yucky, but fingernails, hairs, just things that you wouldn't want in milk if you were going to distribute it and give it to a 600 gram baby. So the milk gets strained and put in those big, these big beakers that are down here. Um, once, it's, once you get enough into the, uh, the beakers, you're going to pass it into a, the flasks, and that makes the transfer even easier. It's two-thirds gone. You're making it, I don't see any heads that have bobbed off, so this is good. <laughs> this is really good. I'm impressed. Because <laughs> I don't know who was on last night, but I'm still impressed. Um, then we get to the point, this is the, the transferring part of it, and you, know, you respect the fact that these moms have worked awfully hard to get us to this phase where, where we, you know, we're handling. So when people call it liquid gold, for a lot of reasons, and even more than I appreciate it, it really gets treated that way. And as you can see, it's, you know, we're, the bonnets, the masks, it's done as, it's not sterile, but it's much more than clean. So it's, again, people that are handling food are probably not dressed like this. So we remember where this is going to go. So when you start off, this is what you, you have to, after you've transferred it, and I don't know if you can appreciate, but the density may be a little bit different, flask to flask, because you may have more than one mom's milk that you're, you're working with. And we haven't combined anything here yet. We just worked with maybe one, two, or th three mom's milk at that time. And the next step is homogenization. So what you've got to do is realize that you've got protein that you don't want to break up, fats that you can, they'll be a little more tolerant, and the carbohydrates aren't really going to be that much of a problem. But if you want to deliver as close to a mother's milk as possible, then you want to be as gentle as possible. And this is a, as you're starting to, I'm sure, see, this is not automated. This is all human hands moving this milk through the process. So this is what um, homogenization 
is. You're literally taking milk from one flask, and this may bring back some painful memories of things like biochemistry and organic chemistry, but you're literally taking milk from one flask, moving it to the next, but you're only taking a certain percentage, about between a third and a half, and moving it, and you have to go through this rotation six times. When you have finished that, and I didn't do the calculation, somebody else way smarter than me did it, but that's what you have to do, and when you do, the milk is going to slowly but surely look identical through all six of the flasks. Um, so you'll go through that six times. It ensures a gentle mixing of all the donated milk, results in equilibration of the caloric density and the nutrients, and that's close to the final product. So you can see from where we started where there might have been little changes, now it's pretty uniform. Still no heads down. Y'all really doing well. <laughs> okay, 90%. And now when you start experiencing this, you think your eyes are starting, you're starting to just have problems. It's not focusing, but it's like almost getting to be a cloudy day, except that the shadows are changing too. And when it even starts getting a little bit darker than this, the street lights come on, the birds get awfully quiet, and you start hearing crickets chirping. I don't make this up. This really happened. Um, when we start going to the bottling, you can see, again, this is all done by hand. So we'll take all the bottles, they'll all get lined up here, either 45 or 90 ml bottles, and my much better half here, I had to get her in here a couple times, um, each one of these bottles, and we always overfill. Everybody gets lined up, okay? So if somebody ought to, because we know there's going to be spillage, there's going to be wastage, and that's more painful to know that something was you know, not getting used or that you ended up being short, that would be the worst. So all of these, these are the, uh, the 90 ml bottles, one at a time. It's an army of them, and you can see by the front, even we have accidents. So nothing is, is perfect when you're, you're pouring in, in here. You don't leave anything to waste. Everything gets, um, gets used that, that's been gone through the homogenization process. They're almost kind of like an army of soldiers. Um, and, and the caps then will start, and th those are the same type of caps that you might struggle with trying to get off because they've got to be watertight because they're about to go into uh, the pasteurizers. Those are what the uh, ounce and a half bottles of 45 ml bottles um, look like. 95%. Bottles are labeled so that they can be identified. Um, the milk is cultured, like we said before, and, but, and after pasteurization. Any abnormalities, a batch gets withheld and doesn't get dispensed. In the, oh my gosh, worrisome case, a bottle of milk went out and we later found out we shouldn't have. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure just eventualities are what they are. Um, each bottle actually has a barcode on it. We can trace every single bottle of milk to know where it went. And, and in fact, as every hospital signs on, one of the things you have to do is you will be cataloging in that milk, and you will know which baby that milk went to if that inevitability ever really does happen. Come on. All right. So these are what the, the uh, one and a half ounce bottles look like. And then what they do is that we put them in these very, these, these, are, these look a lot heavier, th th they are a lot heavier than they look, because these are going to be sitting inside some pretty warm water. We can't have them floating. We can't have the tops becoming um, loosened. So these will be placed inside and inside the automated one, this one, is really big, and you notice the thing in the middle here, it's a temp probe, so that we know that that's going to be the last bottle to get heated, and it's also going to be when these bottles come out of the pasteurizer, we want them chilled as quickly as possible, because the biggest enemy to immunoglobulins <laughs> is going to be about 140 some odd degrees of heat. So it's about 62 and a half degrees centigrade, um, and we want it Pasteurize. We want it to get up to temperature quickly and get down as soon as we've gone through there. And we'll usually preserve about two-thirds to three-quarters of all the immunogenicity of that milk. So it's still going to beat anything from a commercial product, hands down. 
So the, the bottles are placed in a, into a pasteurizer. They get rapidly heated to 144 and a half, maintained for 30 minutes, and then placed in an ice bath for chilling and ultimately refreezing. So this is being lowered into one of the Banuel pasteurizers. And you can see the temperature probe sticking out of there. And we can also see, watch the temperature of the, uh, the water. As soon as it's finished, it comes out. And those are, that, that, all those little nine, uh, 90 ml bottles are sitting inside now. That is ice water. That's got, that's really just maybe a couple degrees above freezing. Enough to chill that down as quickly as possible. And this is what it looks like afterwards. So you have gone from the raw milk to, and we know literally where every single bottle is. So if somebody wants to find the milk from a given mom that was donated on a given day, again, through a program that's all set up, each one of those shelves are monitored, and we know exactly where that, that milk is if we want to um, pull it. There are different programs that we've been working with. In fact, the first donor, I was telling some folks at dinner last night, um, it's not just, sadly, a happy-go-lucky kind of moms that you know, and they do, they get so much out of donating, the baby gets something out of it, the family, everybody from the taxpayer to the insurance company, everybody wins with this. But there are some moms that lose babies, and there are some moms that have had losses while they've got a freezer full and the baby's in the NICU or moms that have babies that pass away from SIDS and will have pumped milk. And so you have this one thing that's called milk drops and teardrops. And the first milk that we processed in the bank was from somebody who had lost a baby that was about three or four months old. So it serves much more of a purpose. I mean, the, the end user it still does what it does. But there's a lot more to this than, again, than I even imagined when we started. Now, when we get to 99% of the sun being obscured by the moon, you would think, and of course, if I'm saying this, you're going to realize you can't, but you would think, oh, I've got to take my glasses off. I don't want to miss anything. And if you do that, you'll be visiting an ophthalmologist for a retinal burn because there's still so much light coming through that even when you're using a camera, at this point, it's time for me to take the filter off that lens. And I'm, look, I'm not looking through the viewfinder. I'm looking at something that's peripheral. So my eyes are not at risk here. But moments after that, this is what it looks like when you take the filter off. And this has got a nickname. They call this a diamond ring for obvious reasons. So that's how much light was coming through moments after the picture you saw before this. Um, but once you get to totality, then you can take glasses off. So this phase lasts for about 15 seconds, but worth every minute of it. Back at, back at the bank, this is waiting for you. This is waiting for a physician or a physician assistant's order to go out. As I said, each one of these is labeled so we know. And you can see on the bottom of it, we can tell you how much protein is in there, the, the volume, obviously, when we do the overfill. Um, some of the milk is not suitable for a six or an 800 gram baby. And we were kind of beside ourselves looking at the protein content and the fat content. And even with certain types of engineering, you really can't buff it up. But it's perfectly fine for term babies. It's perfectly fine for a baby that's got um, a congenital heart defect that we'd rather be feeding formula. If we wouldn't want to be feeding formula. We'd rather be feeding human milk versus formula. And lo and behold, this is great. So. Different protein amounts, different caloric densities on here, because again, we'll know exactly what it is, and the end user knows exactly what they are um, using. And if you choose to, I mean, this can still be fortified. You can just, you still use something like Bena protein to be added, but at least you know what your, st what your starting point is. So how would you order it from an inpatient standpoint? First off, you must get consent from the family. Uh, some states, Pennsylvania being one of them, <coughs> It's considered standard of care. There is no consent. A 27-week baby is delivered. Mom's milk has not yet come in. When the baby's ready to be fed, they're going to get donor human milk. Louisiana, we didn't want to push the envelope too far. And our attorneys and most would tell you it's a foreign substance. It's 
produced by another human being get consent. We've had three, three or four families that have said no out of about the last four to five years. So you still will have a few that just don't find it acceptable, um, and we let them know. I mean, we're not trying to sell it. We're trying to promote it because anybody that's taking care of one baby with necrotizing enterocolitis is taking care of one baby too many. And this, while this is not a cure, it absolutely will diminish your rates. Um, Epic has a patient order set up for expressed human milk, and there's a bottom box that says, you know, check off yes for donors. So this is what we look at um, on Epic, and I know that everybody's program is a little bit different, and especially if you're not, I don't even know if you could type that in and have it come up, but if not, the Epic gurus shouldn't have trouble importing this into, into the system up here. But you can see right from the beginning, it's how are you giving it, whether it's an NG, OG, G2, um, how do you want it, give it over X number of hours. We don't even put in doses. I mean, it, it'll stay open unless you only want to use it for a, a shortened period of time. You can pick your caloric density within reason. I mean, if you order 30 and we don't have 30, you're going to hear that. It, you may have to add fortifier to get it to where you want it to be. Uh, most of the time, if we're, use, if we're going to fortify it, we're going to use liquid fortifier. We list, and it's a hard stop, we list mom's meds um, if we know them so that, again, somebody would, would know what, what they're getting. But realizing that there's very few medications, including herbal supplements and everything, you know, as I said, it would have taken a couple of hours if I brought you all to, to take a look at the papers that, and all the things that we ask. But they're probably the things you'd want to know if you were admitting a baby to your NICU. What was mom taking, whether it's things she should have been or sh things she shouldn't have been. And that's how we'll do the exclusions. And then at the very bottom, hard stop, donor milk. So here, this can be used for regular, you know, a regular mom's milk. But down here, the hard stop, can we use donor, yes or no? If that doesn't get checked off as a yes, then it's not going to get distributed from the bank. Um, what's next for us? We, as I've sort of touched on, we purchased a centrifuge. We're still getting our hands in terms of really using it and uh, processing milk with it so that we can skim the fat off. And that fat, trust me, that fat does not get wasted. It'll go into another batch of milk to bump up calories, but not get it to a point where it's not a balanced diet for a baby. Um, and this, when, when, when the chylothorax idea came up, it was just one of those light bulb moments that the folks in the PI asked us, is it something you could do? It wasn't something I'd like to say I'm bright enough to have come up with, but we looked at each other and said, okay. And so what we did originally was we did this without a centrifuge. We did it where the fat, we could take the fat off the top of some of the milk so we could drop the fat content and decrease the amount of lymphatics. And again, this may be, I get one of the things that just has sprung up from where we had no idea. Um, and hopefully the mom gets to start breastfeeding once the chylothorax resolves. Um, we started an outpatient donor milk program. Again, something I never envisioned to, to even be something that would be needed. We had heard that some well baby nurseries are using this uh, in some cases where maybe a baby, somebody thinks the baby's dehydrated, mom's milk hasn't come in, the bilirubin's rising. It's an expensive way to do that. Um, so that is sort of a doctor and a nursery um, individuality. And I think you, you have to decide whether or not you think that that's well suited for your population. From an outpatient standpoint, we will tell families if we have, sometimes we'll have an adoptive family and they're taking a baby that they would love to have breast milk for a month. We means test them. Literally, if they can, if they've got the financial wherewithal, this is not as expensive as the milk that goes to the babies in the hospital because it's a lower caloric density. It's just not as higher quality of milk. It's still great for a baby, but you don't need to be given 22 and 24 calorie milk to your average term healthy baby. So in some cases, we've been able to do that. And we will distribute it on a needs basis and probably not more than a week or two 
at a time because we have to tell families we don't know what's coming in. So we're sort of at the mercy of our donors and the people that are the end users in NICU. So again, not knowing what the, if we didn't know what the caloric density was, you'd be distributing milk that could potentially go to an ICU patient and, an, and then an ICU patient calls and there's no milk. So this is a secondary market, if you will, but it really, um, we've shipped milk to families out of state that want it. And from our standpoint, it's wonderful because not only is there a small, at least we capture a little bit of revenue back, but it's milk that would otherwise likely go to waste. And that's the last thing you want to have a mom feel like she donated milk with all the pumping and the work that she's done, and then we're sorry we didn't use your milk. Most people that, especially if you just donate a unit of blood, it's you want to know, you don't care whether it went to a trauma victim, a transplant patient, a baby, you just feel good that you've done something like that. So we've got, again, we'll look for medical versus not, as we tier that milk and decide, is it medical, is it non-medical, payment options, discounting. Um, the last one on there, the Medicaid and private insurance, is something that is probably the last horizon. There are about six or seven states in the United States where the, legisl the state legislatures have been able to figure out a way to help hospitals and reimburse them partially for the use of uh, donor milk. Um, my, my wife actually <laughs> spotted that TRICARE is now starting to pay for it. Uh, we have to get our act together in terms of how do we go about billing for this because most hospitals right now, there is not a CPT code or an ICD-9 or 10 code, so this is something that is, is in the works. Um, and in closing, uh, we all know that moms in the southeast, but especially those in Louisiana, make the best milk. We like saying that we like giving Louisiana milk to Louisiana babies, but if babies outside of state benefit from it, that's okay too. Um, but the Milk Bank of Louisiana had the ability, with our supporting moms, an expanding crew of depots to help provide all Louisiana babies with the precious gift. And all I ask of everyone that hears me speak is that we use this really wisely. This is what you want to see. Okay, this is what it ultimately comes down to. And you get to see this for maybe up to anywhere from two to seven minutes. Um, and this is when you can take glasses off and you just sit there and it's the fastest two to seven minutes of your life, I promise you. Um, this is what 2024 will look like. And if you look at this total solar eclipse coming that starts down in Mexico, and you see that path, you see where Shreveport is. And, so, and you see where totality is. So you will see here in Shreveport, um, that's what, if you didn't decide to go anywhere, and you just stayed here on April 8th, 2024, this is what you'd see. Trust me, it's worth the 60 mile drive or whatever to get into and above on this. And this is the, the midline path. So these people are gonna see it for the longest period of time. But here, I think it's about, you know, it's about one and a half to two minutes just getting on the other side here. Not that this is not impressive, it is. But being this close, no, you gotta go. And if you don't, then you're gonna be waiting till 2045. So. Some of us might not be here for that run. So, <laughs> so I think, again, I would tell you to go through it. And when, that, um, when the moon starts pulling away, you get the second diamond ring. And now, if I can make this, now this is a video, but I don't see the thing to help me. Will this let me? You are gonna be the first ones that were gonna see this, but I don't. I won't do it, and I don't know why. I apologize. This was, like I said, this was something that we were hoping um, it was really set up. Let's see if we can try it one more time. Nope. This was. This is actually available. Um, it's on YouTube, and it's also um, on the website. Where this is two. It's about a minute and a half minute and a half to two minutes of video. And this is, this, is, this is disturbing because it worked like a charm <laughs> when I ran through it. But it, it'll take you through everything you just saw in rapid fire. So with that, um, and we made it with eight minutes to go, uh, I'm more than happy to take questions about the process. How do you find the box? 
They find us. Yep. <laughs> They, they literally find us, and, and that's, it's, a, it's a, a great question. When, um, when we started this off, we had the exact same fear, and when we, in, in the processing sheets that we use, one of the sheets literally has demographic information about the mom, and then how did you learn about us? I'd say about one-third to one-half are Facebook. A lot of them are Google. Because if you Google Louisiana Milk Bank, we're at the top there. Um, and so much of it has been, <clears throat> excuse me, word of mouth. Um, the moms in the NI become your greatest spokespeople. Um, people that, uh, um, I don't know, we, we, we talked a little last night. We have to, when we have a mom that has experienced preterm rupture of the membranes and she's on antepartum, buying days at a time, we'll go down and visit. And so we broach this subject then as almost an off the cuff because the level of expectation is that you're going to be involved with your baby's care after she or he is delivered. Don't, you know, you can't quit on us now. We need, and then it becomes convincing families because just as some of you learned when we were, we were one of the last countries to put babies to sleep on their back. And so when you start instructing a family that's taking home their first newborn to have their, their baby sleep on their back now, it's, not, it's kind of OK. If grandma is in the room, not so much. Because grandma looks at mom, and first you get that funny kind of look, and they say, well, wait, it was good enough for you. You slept on your belly. You did OK. Yeah, but there are a few babies that didn't make it through the first six months of life because they didn't. So we're in that kind of mindset in terms of teaching, and then they become our ambassadors. And the more lectures that we have like this, the more visits when I see the Junior League of New Orleans, it starts getting talked about. Um, the license plate on the back of my car used to read preemie. Not anymore. Now it's unfortunate that you can only use seven letters instead of eight. So I am M-I-L-K-B-N-K. So if you pull in behind a white car that says Milk Bank, that's me. Um, so we really are just looking to get the word out. And pediatricians, neonatologists, nurses, you know, nurse practitioners, they have become the ambassadors. And I think the more that the, I've done a couple times on TV down in New Orleans, radio, it's going to be just like teaching people to put their babies to sleep on their back that this is an availability. It's something that, again, it promotes breastfeeding at the beginning, whether you're doing skin to skin. Um, and then we also, just so the people that know about this from, from, my, from my financial standpoint, if a mother, maybe she's HIV positive, maybe she's about to start chemotherapy for uterine or cervical cancer, maybe, yeah. There's a bunch of reasons she may not be able to pump. We had a resident recently that had just undergone bilateral radical mastectomies before she got pregnant because her mother and her sister were positive for the BRCA gene and both had breast cancer. And she just said, and she was going into immunology, she said, not me. So again, having that, for, you know, being forewarned about patients that cannot pump for whatever reason, you don't embarrass yourself, you certainly don't embarrass them. Um, by asking, you make sure that this availability is there since she delivered an 11, 1200 gram baby so that this is able to be offered. But we'll, when I speak to some people from finance today, I'm going to let them know we're not oblivious to the cost. And in fact, we actually take babies when they hit 34 weeks. And whether you can, unless there's a GI or a cardiac reason, they all over about seven days get transitioned to commercial formula. So this is mainly to get us over the hump. It's not meant to, as some people would say, make us the nanny state. We're not looking to do this. We want this to be available to the babies that need it. We we've tried to we wrestled with that for a while to start with. Um, needless to say, payer source is totally irrelevant. So whether your mom is going to pump, whether she's not, whether she can, whether she can't. It's not your fault that you were put in the position you are as a 23-week baby. So these kids, usually anybody under 30 weeks for sure, 
Some places will use 33 or 34 weeks as a cutoff and just use it to get the baby jump started until they get it to a certain point. I don't know too many places going past the 34, 35 week mark, but 100% unless we have a family that says no for whatever reason. And, uh, and even if a mom, like I say, whether she can or can't, and whether she's um, on medicines, we start once we've got consent. And uh, again, we respect the cost. We respect the fact that these women have worked awfully hard to get this to us. And then all the folks that work to do everything that you've just seen, as I said, it's a manual process. So you really want to be careful with it. Um, but we, we start any, and once they're ready to be fed, they're going to get some. Holly, that was a great presentation. I love your analogy to the, uh, to the eclipse. I was wondering why your title was like that. <laughs> because to me, I'm, the, the take home message for that, it's very difficult in our culture, especially in Louisiana, to get mothers to uh, provide breastfeed and Donna can attest to that. Uh, I have a few comments and a question, or a couple of questions. The comments are that this is nothing new. You know, if you remember, you know, historian here, Pierre Baudin had wet nurses when uh, you know, yes, spread all over the world of saving oh, premature oh, babies. Oh, oh, oh. They had uh, breast milk banks and wet nurses and all that stuff. Which was probably you know, which was safer than, the, than, than somebody going on the internet. In 19, if I'm not mistaken, 1900 or 1909 in Vienna, Austria, and then in the US, uh, historically. Uh, but Getting back to your point of the eclipse I'm taking home is we have to emphasize more on breastfeed because it's a culture shift. The grandmothers, the mothers, the great grandmothers gave artificial milk in the form of advertising. They all know about that. Uh, the question I have, again for you, is you said there is no consent. As you know, many pediatric societies, the Canadian pediatric society, European pediatric, they have a consent. And those are less litigious societies than ours. And the reason for that are twofold, from my understanding. And number one, the psychomegalovirus cannot be eradicated by the process you are describing, which is which is very well documented by the what's her name? Karen. Karen uh, her last name starts with a P, a blue. Uh, but she has done extensive work on psychomegalovirus and breastfeeding and breast milk. And her group has clearly shown that you cannot completely eradicate even with a minus 70 degrees defreeze. And the second point is over rare graft versus host reaction is a possibility as uh, I don't know whether anybody did. The problem <coughs> face with milk bank banking again theoretically is ethically it would be not possible to do uh, randomized double blind controlled studies where one group is getting 45 breast milk, one is getting um, milk back at certain calories, you're calculating the same. So that's a problem and it'll never be solved like many other issues in unit. Could you comment on those two? Well, I think from, from a consent standpoint, we do. We originally were hoping, we, you know, that, as I said, <clears throat> yeah, in Louisiana, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we do get consent. It's the... Um, Yeah, in, in um, Pennsylvania, that is where we learned they, they don't. They just consider that standard of care. The attorneys from, from auction, when we were, they were involved in the, from the very, very get-go. As part of it, they said no. Um, even though it's a food and even though it's coming right from a mom, we should be getting consent because exactly um, what you brought up, and especially when something, forget, I mean, CMV was important. How about when the Zika virus showed up? How many women were potentially you could, so, because nobody, there was no research that had yet been done on it. We didn't know if you could transmit it um, from milk. Uh, so we know that the next virus is, sooner or later, that virus is going to be out there that we're not testing for, we're not asking the questions for. So I, I don't see the consent form going away. Um, I think as far as a graft versus host, I don't know how many lymphocytes would actually survive up at uh, 144 and a half degrees for 30 minutes. My guess is probably not that many. And 
we're sort of coming in again at the tail end of this being the 24th, 25th milk bank in the country. And as you said, since this has been done for ages with wet nurses, and yep, it, this is kind of old school being made new again. So I think that the, from our standpoint, it's how safe can you make it and how close to mom's milk can you, can you process it so you don't lose all those valuable uh, immunoglobulins from the pasteuriz pasteurization process. One of the common, I learned by reading papers several years ago, uh, there is a cultural or a religious issue. I was reading this paper, it blew my mind, that in Muslim population, you cannot give, give this without consent of the imam of them. And you may correct me on that. And that is a, that is in the Quran. Well, what I we, accepted that paper for public What the reasons on neonatologists can be educated. What we learned through that exact scenario probably about three or four months ago um, was we had our first Muslim baby that we asked for permission and we, we got turned down. And so we, the docs are really upset by it, the nurses, I mean, everybody. And then we came to realize that it's probably, it's so deeply seated that I believe the way that it, and I, I know I'm ruining the translation of it, but it, it literally came down to if a mother can't provide milk for her baby and another woman does, she's actually one of the mothers of that baby. And I know I'm ruining it and paraphrasing it probably terribly, but at least we then understood why the family turned us down. Anybody in the audience want to guess what happened with that baby? I mean, so fate deals some very difficult, I mean, the baby's still with us, but lost a substantial amount of its intestinal tract. Um, yeah, and it, 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 it was just very, very difficult for a lot of us to, again, wrap our brains around, but we also had to say, listen, this is this family's wishes. They're willing to accept the consequences, and that's unfortunately what, you know, what took place. But, We've learned a lot, and we continue to learn a lot. So thank you. In the interest of time, so in regards to the expiration date, is it similar to Cosmo as far as, far as the expiration date? Well, since this stays frozen as long as it does, we'll usually probably around six months. Some people will let it go as long as a year, but that's again one of the, it's a great question, and that's why we try to move the milk through based on when we get it. And the more we get asked for it, and the more we have moms bringing it in, usually the, the only milk that really sits there for any prolonged period of time will be milk that doesn't go to an NICU. And now with the outpatient program ramping up, we're hoping nothing's gonna get wasted. Thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it.